Welcome. Good evening. So tonight, uh, Martin and I will be presenting, but also Julian Vigas, Mercia's Chief Investment Officer, is here as well. So either through questions after this presentation, or actually after this presentation, when everybody else is finished, we're, we're certainly happy to take further questions. So the market that we address, and what you know, Mercia is uh, an asset management business. We operate nationally but we have regional offices across the country. We're delivering private equity, venture capital, debt, combined with our own proprietary, our own balance sheet capital as well. And the markets that we address are these regional markets. They are small businesses, small to medium-sized SME businesses that are typically looking for about 40 million in total capital needs, where they'll be looking for up to 10 million from Mercia. That's our addressable market. Um, and we are looking to become a you know, a leading investor, in fact, the leading investor, and the acquisition we'll talk about in a moment has moved us out actually to the number one investor across the region, certainly in the Midlands and the north of England. Last year, we took 6% of this addressable market, and that market was a billion. So a billion sterling was invested across those regions in 2018. We took 6% of that, and our target is to take up to 20% of that the following year. Six months ago, we set out some strategic objectives for the business. First one was to move the group to trading profitably ahead of balance sheet realizations and fair value movements. So this is a tr profitable trading group, and uh, Martin will talk to some of the figures in that respect. And that's over a three-year vision, so between uh, 2020 and 2022. To grow assets under management, we have half a billion uh, assets under management, AUM, as of July uh, this year, and to look over the next three years to grow that to a billion. And to maintain what we call our 15% IRR across everything we do, across our private equity, across our venture, and across our balance sheet. And to put that into perspective, our first and our oldest venture fund to unwind has got a 15% IRR just over that. Our first and oldest private equity fund is unwound now at 19% IRR and our balance sheet is currently operating at a circa 14%. And that's really important to maintain that return across all the asset classes that we manage. But fundamentally, it's to evergreen our balance sheet. And that's because what we're creating here is a sustainable, valuable, and valued for those investees looking for, for investment uh, business, where we have a balance sheet that is generating cash realizations above and beyond our investment rate from it. And I think it's important to spend just a few seconds on the business model that we operate, which is a slightly different uh, model that we've been developing. We came to the market December 2014, but the business has been building for, uh, since 2007, 2008, before we listed on AIM at that point. And the model is very much one of using third-party funds under management initially to support businesses, regional businesses, and then over time, selectively bringing those across to the balance sheet to scale them. Our balance sheet capital, our proprietary capital, serves two, two purposes. We're an investor, a limited partner in a number of the funds that we manage, and we scale selectively businesses looking for scale-up capital from those funds under management. When they come onto the balance sheet, we're looking to turn those into cash over a three to seven year period when we bring them through. So put that all into context. Over uh, 2018, we saw something like 2,800 business plans across the regions came into Mercia. We pretty much see everything on a regional basis and therefore nationally. We invested in 123 of those opportunities through the third party funds, and two of those came across onto the balance sheet. So that is how we sort of funnel things through and selectively scale them up onto the balance sheet. But why the UK regions? It's a question we often get asked. Why, why does Mercia selectively focus on the UK regions? 96% of all of the investments we made were outside of London. Okay, so we are, really are investing outside of the London area. And what this first schematic shows is where the equity, so these are figures that have been published in 2018 showing where the equity investments took place in the UK. And what this number here is, for those who can't read at the back, there's 46% is on there. And that's 46% of all equity investment took place not in the southeast of England, in London. So about half of all investment, equity investments took place in London itself. This next schematic shows where the distribution of high growth firms are. So these blue dots here are proportional to each other. And what that actually shows is, and high growth firms are defined as businesses growing on a revenue basis of at least 20% per annum. And what this shows is actually in London, about 20% of those, 22% of those high growth firms are located in London. Where we're based is in the regions. So in other words, where those 80% high growth firms are located, where there's a limited amount of capital being supplied to them, that's where Mercia's locations are. 
We have eight regional offices. As of January, we'll be 100 people across those, unearthing deals, supporting deals, and doing deals and transacting. We have 19 university partnerships, again, within the regions. They account for about 20% of our, our investments. Our funds under management are regional funds that we're deploying as well. You know, regions are at our heart of what we do. And the business itself has been growing well in terms of assets under management, which is a clear indicator of growth as capital follows us on this journey. So over that three-year period from April 2013 to March 2016, we've grown assets under management from 22 million to 300 million. We acquired a business called Enterprise Ventures based in the north of England, and our employees started back here. So back at April 2013, we had five, five people. We floated with seven. We now have 16 employee, uh, 60, sorry, 60 employees, four offices, and 14 university partners on that three-year three -year period. Then the following three-year period, so up to March 2019, 85 people now across eight uh, offices, 19 university partners now, and we've grown assets under management from 300 million to 500 million. So again, continuing to scale AUM. And a number of you have already asked us about the placing. So we've got a placing coming through, and the questions that we've been asking is, you know, why a placing? Why are you doing placing, and, and why are you doing that placing now? Well, one of the things is timing. And the reason here is that there is a compelling window of opportunity for Mercia. So what we've done, we had a strategic review earlier in the year, and we looked at the assets under management that we managed. So we have early stage venture funds moving away through to the late stage, and we have our balance sheet capital here. But we had a gap between basically our early stage funds and the balance sheet, and what you call a sort of series A, series B investment area. And so we scanned the market, and there's a market within a number of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with VCTs, Venture Capital Trusts. And the VCTs changed what they did because of the government restrictions and legislation changed back in 2016 and moved them from private equity investment to venture capital investment. The rules changed in terms of the types of businesses, what they're called knowledge intensive businesses that they could invest in. So there was a change going on within that industry and that fitted very well with what we were doing. Now, typically, these VCTs have stayed with the same manager for 20, 30 years. These are very well-known, very well-established things. Um, earlier in the year, Gresham House, actually, another asset manager, acquired um, what were the Baronsmead, the Living Bridge VCT contracts. And so that sort of changed an attitude and approach going on with the industry and created a moment of opportunity for Mercia. We scanned across where the VCTs were operating, and there was one VCT house, Northern Venture Management, which fitted really well. Their offices, Manchester, we're in King Street here in Manchester, their offices are near us, they're on the same street. So their offices are the same in our regions, very good reputation, fantastic team, the whole team is joining us after this acquisition, and fitted really well with our assets, and you'll see in a moment, there's a slide where you can see it, how it fits very, very tightly. So what that, what that shined up was a, was a window of opportunity for Mercy to move into this area. So why the quantum? Why are we raising 30 million? So 15 million was for the initial consideration to acquire this business and the transaction costs. So that's the first 15 million. And the second 15 million is to fulfill, if I can just remind you of that initial slide talking about what we set out we are looking to do over the next three years. This moves the balance sheet to an evergreen status. This means that what we've got here is a business acquisition that provides a profitable group there after this acquisition and cash on, on hand that moves the balance sheet to an evergreen status really important progress and, and a metric for Mercia. And that's why the quantum, we don't want any more than that, that's enough to get us there. We could have raised more, but we don't want any more than that. So why the share price discount? So if you had an oversubscription of 30, pay, 30, 30 million, we were looking for 30 million, we had more than 30 million, why the share price discount? Well, originally the book was built at about 22 pence, we had a 31p share price, so a significant discount. And as our brokers, we've got Canaccord here tonight, but as our brokers, Canaccord and M plus one singer, try to move that up, what we found is at 26p, the book fell apart, and we didn't get that minimum amount. At 25p, we could get it. And our decision was actually to move forward. This is an important transformational acquisition for the business and was critical for fulfilling our next steps, and that's why we went for it. We were sitting in an environment at the time, which still is, is of uncertainty. And so getting this money, being able to take the business to profitability and evergreen status, I think was a very clear uh, and very important way forwards. And as I said, it takes us to a position where we can both evergreen the balance sheet and move the business forward. But more importantly, which is something that's very important to many of us anyway who invest in the ventures, you must invest through cycles. The one thing that's for sure is the venture cycle will come off and the private equity cycle will come off and the debt cycle. They all move in different places. But where you make your money is an ability to follow your money through those cycles. 
we have a significant amount of cash on hand now to follow through those cycles and an important, important again step for us. And then the final point, and, you know, and this is a really important point. What I will say is that we, when we made this announcement it was going to happen, we've received between 30 and 40 contacts from retail investors saying, why no open offer? And what Martin and I have done is we've emailed and phoned every single one back to describe why no open offer. And the reason was we set up initially to do an open offer. So we wanted an open offer. We wanted to move forward because we are very interested in supporting the institutions and retail investors on our, on our share register. And so it was set up to do an open offer. What happened is when the book was built at 25 pence, and just to remind you, we were at 31p, that that discount, the advice that we were given is that discount, you will have certain investors uh, that may well take an advantage of selling at one price and buying at another, and it will anchor the price to the 25p, and therefore disadvantage anybody not wanting to be part of that open offer, which we understood the logic of that and pursued that, and that's why no open offer. So the alternative was an accelerated book build. So we opened that up for, th for a number of hours. That brought in £4 million, I think, in about two or three hours, of which quite a few retail came onto that as well. And so although we've had 30 or 40 emails from retail being un unhappy with the lack of open offer, we've had an equal number of people who've actually said this is a really good thing. So it's been, a, been an interesting balance that we've had to, we've had to put up through. But this, this is why the placing, and this is why now for Mercia. And what that does, this acquisition, is it moves us along now 100 employees, absolutely, but it takes us to 770 million, so circa 800 million of assets under management, and moves this to a profitable group by acquiring three VCT fund management contracts from MVM. And it means we're very well prepared now for 2020 and, importantly, onwards. We've reached scale, and we will continue to scale organically. As when we bought Enterprise Ventures, we bought that business and then doubled assets under management organically afterwards, we will now scale organically. But this grows our FUM by over 50%. We're, we're a profitable group. Following this acquisition, we are an, a cash-generative business going forward, and I think that's absolutely important and critical for our existing shareholders. We have, and you'll see in a slide later on, we have 250 million now of free cash to invest across the group in those private equity, debt, venture, and our proprietary capital. And our revenue model now has really improved in terms of we've got 80% recurring revenue, contracted recurring revenue from our third-party funds. Very compelling, very strong. We can look forwards with some certainty over the coming years and know what that revenue is that's coming through. The balance sheet matures, and we'll talk to that in a moment. We have 23 direct investments, circa 100 million in its value just on the balance sheet alone. And importantly, we're seeing fair value movements, and in our first half of our results, we're very positive progress as the momentum continues to build. And we will have 31 million of cash on hand on our balance sheet as well in terms of supporting existing investments. Thanks, Mark. Uh, good evening, everybody. I I'd just like to spend a few minutes talking in a little bit more detail about the proposed acquisition. So, subject to our shareholder approval on Friday at the general meeting of the placing, uh, we've conditionally agreed to acquire these three VCT fund management contracts for a total consideration of £25 million. That 25 maximum is split two-thirds of the initial consideration, which you can see here is 75% in cash, and 4.2 million in new Mercia shares, and those shares will be locked in for 18 months. And then there is an earn out, there's a deferred and contingent consideration element, which is the, the other third of the total consideration. And again, it's split 6.3 million in cash over three years, and 2.1 million at the end of those three years, if the performance metrics have been achieved. Again, those shares would be locked in for a period of time. Uh, and as Mark said, the conditional placing of 30 million funds both the initial cash consideration of the acquisition, transaction fees, and evergreening our balance sheet. I think it's worth noting here that in terms of deal metrics, this is a six and a quarter times EBITDA multiple for this acquisition. And as Mark has said, that the transaction rationale is based around our own scale, taking us from a net expenses position to what we call a net income position. Um, evergreening our balance sheet makes us the number one player in our target markets, um, and we believe over the long term is definitely going to be additive for shareholders. Okay. To give you an idea about the revenues from these three VCTs, the total revenues, uh, 2019 revenues to March, 7.2 million, and 
a high percentage of that, like our own business, is recurring revenues. And these contracts generate profits of circa four million. Uh, they have a 12 months notice clause in them, so they are evergreen contracts, um, unless for any reason any of the, one of the VCTs give notice. The business, the portfolios fit very, very neatly with our own business. We do venture, that's in our DNA, and that's exactly what the venture team are doing currently in NVM and the 10 of them that are joining us. And this just gives you some sort of pro forma, put the two businesses together, 10.7 million, 1.4 expenses was our, our results for the full year to March 19. Add on the N NVM VCT pro forma numbers there, and you can see what our sort of our day one group looks like. And we anticipate at least an additional 100 million of new funds under management coming on stream in the next 12 months. And again, that will help drive not just top line, but also profitability as well. Um, buying is easy, owning is hard. And the way that you overcome the challenges of owning something new is integration planning, as in fact as the previous speaker mentioned. And we put a lot of work into this, uh, we've got a lot of experience of M&A in our business, and for this particular transaction, even though it's only 7 million revenues, even though it's only, say, 10 people, we have 158 work streams already been activated uh, and in this particular transaction, a lot of those work streams are around people and around communication. The investment team that will be coming across to us will go through a cheapy process, um, and we're really looking forward to welcoming. They're a good team. As Mark said, the office overlap is, is really, really strong. So their Newcastle office member comes to our Newcastle office, Manchester comes to our Manchester office, Birmingham comes to our Henley office, and we have people in London, and so do they. And, and we've been in contact with all of those people and they're all looking forward to joining us. To ensure the continuity of service to the three main market VCTs, we've signed a 21-month transition services agreement to ensure that that quality of service, which NVM have provided for many years to those VCTs, will be maintained. And over time, we will recruit and build up our own expertise uh, to service those three main market VCTs. Moving on briefly to our interim results, which we also announced on the same day. Um, uh, revenues have increased by 5% by year on year. Um, we've, we've built out, pretty much built out our team now, so our net expenses were up very slightly. Mark will talk a bit more in a minute about the fair value movements in our balance sheet portfolio. Uh, and overall, we, we just uh, improved slightly on the, on the year before, but these results were in line with the, sort of the market's expectations. And in the balance sheet, you can see again, when Mark and I floated this business, it's five years ago tomorrow, actually, we, we floated Mercia. We started with a balance sheet investments of nine million pounds. And, and now we've just passed the 100 million, 100 million mark. And the good thing about that is that many of those businesses that we first invested in after, in the first year after our float are now five, six years into their, their journey to maturity. And we still have a healthy cash balance uh, to invest. Top that up with the cash that we're raising through the placing, and we've evergreened our balance sheet. And we can, we can then survive through any economic cycles that, that come our way. I'll just pass back to Mark now to talk a little bit more about the expanded group. Thank you. So I think just in the last couple of minutes, what I'll do is I'll skip through, skip through the remaining slides and we can talk further. But this is a really important slide in terms of how the acquisition fits within our own assets under management. So you can see what I was saying before about the early venture then Series A, if you like, with the um, VCTs, and then our balance sheet scales those businesses and co-invest. Private equity and debt sit alongside each other and work to each other, but rarely do they work into the venture side of things. You add this across and you get to our, our 770 million in terms of funds under management. We've got approximately 400 companies now across the portfolio. We are an important provider of capital now on a regional basis. We are returning money extremely well across all asset classes, and that's a, a performance to really be proud of, frankly, within the team, and a team that I'm very proud of. And we've got liquidity there, as I said before, 250 million. And actually, liquidity is really important for our share registers as well. So something like 50% of our share registers free float, 
We've got a lot of shares trading, selling and buying on the share register so people can come and go. And again, back to the retail point, that's really important, frankly. An ability to buy and sell in Mercia is a critical point for any AIM business. And certainly my observation has always been that liquidity is a limit for many AIM businesses. Then you look down, this is what Martin was alluding to. These are our, our direct investments. We've got that 3.2 million fair value movement, which isn't by one particular investment, that's by a suite of them. Our investments that we're investing in is across a suite of them. We have a very well balanced, and this shows this portfolio in terms of our holding percentages as an entire piece, but also in terms of the sectors that we go across, and also in terms of the stages. So this is the balance sheet. You can see that something like 70% uh, of our portfolio is in strong revenue growth or profitability. So this is not an early stage portfolio on our balance sheet. This is a reflection of those businesses in terms of their progress. These are sort of our top four or five assets. The commercial partners they're going, the revenue growth, 700%, 1,000%, 1,000%. These are businesses in strong growth. Very proud of this portfolio. These are regional businesses that we're growing and delivering from. This is the portfolio that's coming through. We have a lot of businesses coming through now from our managed funds that could come into the VCTs, and which is why it was attractive when we were talking to the VCT boards about this proposal, is you've got deal origination coming into the VCTs and eventually onto the balance sheet. So we have built a machine now that is scaling really well, really well. And then finally, the, you know, we're a people business. In the regions, from the regions, to the regions is in our internal mantra. That's what we're focused on doing. We've got 100 people now within Mercia. We're building these people through it, through our eight regional offices, our university partnerships. I'm very proud to say that 41% of our staff, and I sort of look in this room at the moment, and 38% of our investment team are women. You know, we have a good team, a diverse team, in terms of gender and in terms of eth ethnicity as well. And we do things that are more than just investment. Mercia spirit. So we do a thing called a skills builder. We give away our time. We don't give away shareholders' funds. We give away our time in our time in the evenings and the weekends. Skills builder partnerships where we help children. We're helping kids at schools about business planning, about financials, really important things as they go through that journey. Cancer research was something that we nominated because a number of our employees unfortunately have cancer. And this was seen as very dear to us. Again, we give our time away in quite a competitive fashion. We structured into teams competing each other to raise money for cancer research. Mercia Academy, we bring interns, associates, through investment managers, we train them internally. We're trying to build professionals within a regional basis, something, again, we feel very passionate about. Mercia Knowledge, you walk into any one of our offices, there's these big TV screens showing the deals we're seeing, uh, looking at, showing uh, transactions, the exits. We have all of this information that can be accessed through a bespoke CRM system that we've created. Again, something very important. And the Mercia platform, just last of all, is something we've built internally. We do our own corporate advisory, we build syndicates around our investment teams. We've brought in something like a billion of investment from 19, uh, 90 co-investors. We've got our in-house research, we have in-house legal, and we have a thing called a portfolio resource. We do searches for our C-suites and for our NEDs as we build teams around our growing companies. That's all internal to us. This really stands us out, and it's, it, what we've really been doing the last five years is building a system we can scale. We've got MVM, we're bringing nine people across, 270 million of funds under management. That's it, because we have a platform to scale from now. And I'm very proud of what we're creating and what we're doing going forwards. I'm sorry to overrun, and thank you very much for your time. Lovely, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Hands up. <coughs> Excuse me. Any questions for Mark and Martin? Peter, please. Hi. Um, I'm interested in your share price movement. <coughs> Uh, obviously, um, it has not been uh, lower than the, the current open offer. It certainly was higher. I've, yes. uh, I've had some shares for quite a while now, and I've taken a big hit on that. Uh, what is the actual opportunity for getting back to where it was and higher? So, I, I, absolutely. And, it, and, it, and it's not going to be a reassurance to you, but as a, as a founder and as an investor, me too. You know, I've been hurt by this, so absolutely. So, so the the... There are a number of things to, to answer that question. The first one is actually the rationale, can it get higher? Absolutely. One of the things here is how does Mercia get re-rated? Because as it sat in a community of balance sheet investors doing early stage investment and failing to deliver. And what we've done is we've positioned this as an asset manager that is a profitable asset manager with capital, adequate capital, growing funds under management and balance sheet realizations coming through. That's how it gets re-rated. It shows that the model can deliver. And we're very confident with this acquisition. So back to the, the three-year goals, well, within a year, we think we'll hit those three-year goals. And that's how we'll get re-rated. 
Um, I can't promise you that that share price will come back because you get the share price you deserve, of course. But we think that we're building a business where that share price has every chance of recovering. And then in terms of the open offer, 25p share price, circa 25p, absolutely. You know, we, we had, what we had done originally was we, we did this accelerated book build to preserve the share price uh, as we thought. But unfortunately, a commentator put a sell on the back of its perception on our treatment. I accept that on the retail and that resulted in a sell position. We'll, we'll get that back. Gentlemen behind. Okay, Will Davis, yeah. along the same lines. Last week, you issued 39% more shares at a 40% discount to NAB. With no open offer, you effectively have broken the trust between the company and its small shareholders. To use a sort of Andrew Neal style of asking questions, why should any uh, prospective share, small shareholder, non-institutional shareholder, ever invest in you again and trust you not to do the same thing? Yeah, no, I, you know, uh, it's, we, we acted how we felt was in the interest of retail. And frankly, with hindsight, regret it. To, to, to operate, and that's to vote my shares, both against the offer and against the reappointment of members of the board when the annual general meeting comes up. And, and, and you're, you're, you're all entitled to that. So, so back to my point about there's liquidity on it. You're entitled to buy and you're entitled to sell. Um, Holder should take warning. A question at the front here, please. What? Well, uh, no, no, I, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's address, worth addressing, absolutely. So, so, do I regret not doing the open offer? Tremendously. Absolutely tremendously. Do I regret the acquisition and placing? No. So, the acquisition is right for the business, the placing is right for the business. Not doing an open offer was wrong. You know, it was wrong, and I'm standing here today saying it's wrong. So, so I can't undo that. It, it, it is what it is. What I can reassure you is I think this is a compelling... If you, if you look at this business and look, just ask yourself, is this business worth more than 25 pence a share? That's the question you have to ask. And if your answer is no, then you're a seller. And if the answer is yes, you're a buyer. Uh, question, uh, sorry, well, question at the front first, please. Sorry. It's, it's not really a question, it's a comment. So often you see the market overreact dramatically to situations. And I see that as an opportunity. And I would also say to my colleagues at the back, I saw that as an opportunity to buy more at a cheaper price. I love the story. I love the strategy. The synergies are all sitting there. And I, I just think instead of getting angry about it, they should just buy more shares. Thank at you the back. Much. Thank you. Well, just and, and in couple fact, of it's probably worth noting that you'll have seen an awful lot of trading in Mercia shares since the open offer was announced. And what's been interesting, although obviously there was a, a, a fair degree of, of uh, private investors selling after the Investor Chronicles note, but there has been an awful lot of buying by private investors as well. And so thank you very much for that. Can I ask, when you're realizing investments, are you able to realize roughly at your NAV um, that what, what they're being held for on the books? And what's the performance of your VCT funds and the ones you're buying relative to peer group? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a very, so two, two questions there. So the, the first question is to do with balance sheet. And, and, it, and it's, it's absolutely imperative. That well, the and, industry, the and the fund nav, whatever's in the fund nav. Absolutely, the VCT absolutely. Is difficult yeah. to so, so if I can split the two across. The, the sure. first one is the balance sheet position. And that, you know, that's to do with valuation. What's your philosophy on valuation? And of course, the ultimate test of that is what you're selling them for. So we've had three exits so far from the balance sheet, all of them above the holding value. So we expect to sell the assets on the balance sheet above holding value. But if we sell them materially above holding value, you could then make the argument you've got the valuation wrong in the other direction. So you have to make sure you're there. But our expectations will, ex will sell them above the holding value. And we are doing that. And as I said before, when they come onto the balance sheet, we have a three to seven year window. And we've been meeting and beating that. And then to the VCT, the three VCTs, they've had a sort of total share return of about 2.2. And they have a 4%, and they've been a consistent 4% div coming off that. Those VCTs perform very, very well. The team that's been doing those investments historically is coming across onto us. The investment strategy is not changing. What we're actually doing is we're wrapping resource around it, the resource I talked about before, to enhance its performance, not to detract its so, performance. So what's that relative to their peer group? What do VCTs typically do? 
So, so there, are, there are two ways, and you're right, part of our due diligence was looking at this, is we looked at, we looked at ha, ha, what's good, what does good look like in VCTs? And there are two ways that people have measured this. One is to do with NAV growth and performance, and the other one is consistency on dividend, frankly. And so NVM, if you look at that and you talk to the advisors and intermediaries, you look at the Churchill reports, you'll see NVM is in the sort of top three performers consistently year on year on year. So, and that works really, really well for us. And, and just one final related one that you didn't quite touch on is the assets in your funds, when you come to, come to exits, uh, not on your balance sheet, are they coming out in a similar way? So rough premiums to whatever they're carried yes. at. Yeah, and you know, our, our oldest um, uh, venture fund's done very well. Uh, that's returned 5.3 times uh, capital back to investors in that fund, 15.3% IRR. Back to my point about IRRs, we try to make sure that IRR smooths across the group. It's a great way of, people have not mentioned conflicts, but it's a great way of making sure conflicts are managed to make sure you've got consistency of IRR going across the asset classes. Thank you very much. I had a quick question, if I may, Mark. Um, I know, <laughs> I'm allowed. Um, <laughs> how does one value the VCT, uh, the, the, the contracts? You've said maximum consideration 25 million pounds, yeah. there's three of them. But there aren't a huge amount of transactions in this space. There aren't. H how do you get to that valuation? Okay, so very briefly, so price is the last thing we look at. Okay, um, as I said earlier, buying is easy, uh, and a lot of people make the mistakes when they're doing M and A of, of thinking if I can get this particular, you know, business for, at this price, it's a good deal. That's not how we look at it. We look at the fundamentals. We look at a thing called value driver analysis. We look at really closely at as many reasons as we can think of. Uh, as to why we, we believe this would be in shareholders' best interest. We, have a, we set a very high hurdle of 20. If we cannot come up with what we call 20 value drivers, we pass. And in NVM's case, we came up with 23 value drivers for, for the combined business. So then you move on from that, and then you start to look at, are there market comparables out there? And as Mark mentioned, Cresham House did acquire, November 18, they acquired the Living Bridge contracts, VCT contracts, and that was an eight times multiple. Okay, so, okay, there's a precedent transaction, and this is at, this would then you have our assessment of the value drivers of what we think the the value of the combined business would be for our shareholders, and we ended up at we, I'm pleased to say we ended up at six and a quarter times, and in terms of risk mitigation around those contracts, um, you can see that in the in the mix of deferred and contingent consideration, and you can also see it in the initial consideration in terms of cash and shares which will be locked in for 18 months. Right. That's how we do it. I've got a few more, but we will move on. Thank you very very much. Thank indeed. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.